One of the reasons why we do come together as, as brothers and sisters is to worship God, but it's also to get near to God, to draw near to Him. And in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, we see how God had prescribed how man could draw near to Him. And we looked at that a little bit last week. You know, we were given the, the sacrificial system. You know, last uh, Saturday, uh, not yesterday, but the week before, was Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And it was the one day God had set aside for man to come, and He would forgive their sins. And we looked at that word atonement. And it was basically their sins were covered over. But through all the temple worship, that was how God had prescribed that man could draw near to God. You know, he says you'll do it in this specific way, in this specific manner. You'll bring these specific offerings. And, and through all of that, you can draw near to me. But as we looked at, it, it wasn't the, the actual the, the, the blood of the goats and the bulls and all that type of thing that God was looking at. He was looking at the faith of the nation of Israel and their obedience. So let me just ask you, how well did the nation of Israel do with that? Really well? A grade, right? B? D? No, they failed, didn't they? They went through and they started, it became just a religion to them. It was, it was a form and a fashion. You know, they went through the rituals. You know, and, 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 and what we looked at, you know, even the Day of Atonement became kind of a ritual to them. They went and they did the sacrifices and their sins were taken care of and they were good to go for another year, right? Well, you know, when I look at the church age, you know, people kind of look at, at Sundays that way too, don't they? I'll go to church on Sundays and then I will be good for the rest of the week. Do you think God's just satisfied with us walking with him just on Sundays? No. Do you think God was satisfied with the nation of Israel just walking with the him one day out of the year? And God knew the nation of Israel. So he prescribed uh, you know, the feast days and the Sabbaths and all the different things that man was supposed to look at and understand and perceive God's will. But they just became a religious ceremony. You know, and, I, and as I look around our nation, a lot of churches are full of religious ceremonies. People going through the motions. Remember one church we attended every year about this time, they start talking about hanging of the greens and doing all sorts of different things because it's what they've always done. And they don't perceive, you know, there was, there was a reason they started doing those things early on, but the reason has been forgotten. And I think the same thing could be said about the nation of Israel. And we're going to look at that just a little bit today. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1. And as we were going through our Sunday school lesson, there, there was a reference to Isaiah chapter 1, verse 9 in there. So, you know, this is something that we see throughout the Bible. You know, you know in, in Romans, Paul was talking to the church, the church in Rome, and, and encouraged them basically you know, to understand God's will and not to get caught up in the, in the religious things, you know, the temple worship, because the temple worship was supposed to be a shadow of things to come. Well, the nation of Israel here in, I, in Isaiah, you know, they, they had been given the temple worship. They had been given, you know, theirs were the patriarchs. Theirs was, you know, the temple worship. Theirs was everything God had laid out. But he now has something to speak against the nation of Israel. Because for them, they would rebelled against God. Even though they were still doing all the temple worship things, their heart wasn't in it. They were just going through the motions. So let's see what God has to say to the nation of Israel. Isaiah chapter 1, we're going to start out at verse 10. Now it says here, Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. You know, that's an interesting way to start a, a, a rebuke, isn't it? 
Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, we just got done looking at that in the book of Genesis not too long ago. Abraham and Lot, you know, Lot had decided to live there in the Jordan Valley and he lived in the towns of, you know, of, of Sodom. And, and the wickedness was, was prevalent everywhere you would look there. And God destroyed the nations, you know, the, or excuse me, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah because of their wickedness. Now, God is referring to his people and Jerusalem as Sodom and Gomorrah, figuratively. But it's because of that same spirit dwelling there and the rulers. But it says here, hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Do you think that the rulers of Sodom were listening to the word of God? No, they, they, they had long since not uh, perceived what God was saying through the law. You know, if, if you really were looking at the law, you know, there's those people that try and observe the letter of the law, you know, and that's what the nation had become. But really, when you start looking into like the Ten Commandments, the first four of the Ten Commandments are about loving God. If you love God, you're not going to take his name in vain. You're not going to have other gods before him. You're not going to have idols. You're going to remember your divine appointments. For the nation of Israel, that was the Sabbath. And, and the, the last six are about loving your neighbor. Because if you're loving your neighbor, you're not trying to kill him or take his stuff. Okay? So, but here he says, Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. They had stopped listening to God, but they were just going through the motions. I'm sure glad people just don't go through the motions today. That doesn't happen, does it? There's a lot of people that are very religious. You know, a guy has mentioned it, and I have too, that you know, one of those things that just you know, sounds like, you remember fingernails on the chalkboard? That sound? That's when somebody says, well, you're a religious person. And to me, that's just that, that same, you know, that sound, you know, going through my mind of, I hope I'm more than just religious. But that's what the nation of Israel had become, a nation that was religious. It continues on. It says, the multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? I have more than enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my courts? Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moon, Sabbaths, and convocations. I cannot bear your evil assemblies. Your new moon festivals and your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. Now, God is the one that had instituted temple worship. So is God saying, well, I did it wrong? Or is the problem with the people that are coming to God? It's the people, right? It's the nation of Israel. They're coming with the wrong motives. Mm -hmm. You know, the sacrifices. You know, the, the, the shedding of innocent blood was supposed to point towards the fact that an innocent substitute was going to die for their sins, mm -hmm. which is really, truly pointing towards Christ. Mm -hmm. See, under the temple system, it wasn't the blood of the bulls and the goats that saved them. Mm -hmm. It was their faith in what God had promised. We just got done looking at that, you know, Abraham. When God told him, I want you to take Isaac up on one of the mountains of Moriah, which I'll tell you about, and sacrifice him there as a burnt offering. It wasn't that God was trying to establish child sacrifice. He was looking at the faith that Abraham had in responding to what God had said. Remember, he got up there on top of the mountain and he was about to sacrifice Isaac, but in his own heart, he'd, he'd already received Isaac back from the dead because, God, you promised me I was going to have descendants through this child. So, Lord, you got a problem. I don't. You're going to have to fix this. And God stopped him from sacrificing Isaac. Mm -hmm. It was faith. Well, the nation of Israel had lost sight of that. 
The word of God meant nothing to them. The law meant nothing to them. And so they were just going through the motions. Ever caught yourself just going through the motions of life? You know, get up, get ready, get dressed, go to work, come back, you know. I mean, just, you do those things, it becomes habit, right? Mm -hmm. Well, for them, God had to become just a habit. You know, worship of God was just something they do. Mm -hmm. I think we've seen in COVID, <clears throat> you know, when, when a lot of uh, people were told you have to socially distance and you need to not go to church and those type of things, people just kind of drifted away from God because the, the reason that they came to church beforehand was a lot of times it was just habit. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's Sunday, we got to go to church. Well, they got to go to church or do they get to go to church? There's a difference in the heart, isn't there? Well, for a lot of people it was, well, we got to go to church. Oh, you mean we don't have to go? They're, they're telling us not to go? Oh, Yippee. You know, they, 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 they went off and did their own things anymore. Mm -hmm. That's kind of, you can picture how that had become the, the, what was happening in the nation of Israel. Their hearts were in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. You know, the, 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 the feasts that God had appointed, they were supposed to gather together to worship God, to assemble together. What's happening to the churches today? God is the one that says, don't forsake yourselves the assembling of yourselves together. Are we any different today than back then? Yeah. People are saying, I really don't need to go to church. I can worship God out here on the lake mm -hmm. or in the mountains or things like that. No, you know, God's the one that has ordained this. But we see what happened to the nation of Israel when they didn't obey. Yeah. They, they drifted from God and they also drifted from his blessings. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and all the meaningless offerings. You know, they would come and they would bring their lambs and their rams and their oxen and all those things. And, and they would offer their blood and, you know, the fellowship offerings and all those things. But they had no meaning because they didn't know what the law said, what the word of God said. What? Why are you killing that lamb? Well, it's just what we do. I'm a sinner, you know, so we sacrifice the lamb and then the priest says you're good to go for another year. And God says, basically, I, I cannot bear your evil assemblies. And back there in verse 14, he says, I am weary of bearing them because they have become a burden to me. Just going through the form, you know, the, the ritual, that's not what pleases God. It goes on to say in verse 15, when you spread your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Even if you offer many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. We'll stop right there for a second. You know, basically the picture, you know, if, if they understood the, the offerings that were made, you know, the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, that day when the, the two goats were chosen and one, the lot was cast for the, the, uh, that fell upon the one goat was the, the, the one that was appointed to the Lord and that's the one that would die. The other goat was called the scapegoat and the, and the high priest would lay his both hands on the head of the, that goat and basically it was symbolic of all the sins being put upon that goat and being you know, led out into the desert never to be seen again, being symbolic of what Christ was going to accomplish for us. See, on the cross, all of our sins were laid upon Christ, upon his head. And he has taken them. And as far as God is concerned, once we, once we come to Christ as our Lord and Savior, our sins are seen no more. Our hands are washed clean. See, that was the thing that the, the Israelites were missing. The fact that their sins were forgiven and that they, that, that, that they were covered over, never to be seen again in the Old Testament. You know, but the problem is, is it didn't change them. You know, have you ever seen some dirt on a wall? You know, you got a dirty spot on the wall and you just come over and you paint it. Is, is the dirt gone or is it just covered over? Covered over. 
or stain, right? You know, not, nothing ever gets stained in our homes, you know. You know, especially little kids with crayons and they go to town or markers on your walls. You know, you can try getting rid of it, but it's still there. So what's the solution? Paint over the top of it, right? Taken care of. But it's always still there, isn't it? Well, that's the Old Testament. You know, that's the Old Covenant. Their sins were covered over by the blood, but it was supposed to be in faith to what God was going to do. Back to verse 17. And, 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 the, and it says, learn to do right. Seek justice, encourage the oppressed, defend the cause of the fireless, plead the case of the widow. God just laid out, he says, this is, we're told in the New Testament that this is what pure religion is. Religion that God approves of. To take care of widows and orphans and then not to allow oneself to be corrupted by this wicked world that we live in. But see, the thing is, is religion isn't what gets us to God. That's what mankind has made it out to be. Mm -hmm. All the different religions in the world, well, they'll tell you, we've got the answer. We'll get you to God. Just come in and, and we'll, we'll, we'll tell you the answer if you join our program. But God's idea of religion is, is because of what you've received, this is what I want you to do. Mm -hmm. It's not how you get to God. It's what you do because we have gotten to God. You know, nation of Israel, they weren't doing the things God approved of mm -hmm. to take care of the widows. Because back then, the widows had no voice. Orphans, they, they, had, they had no hope. The alien amongst them, they had no standing. You know, to defend the cause of the fireless, plead the case of the widows. They, they had long since departed from God's ways. Verse 18 says, come now. Let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the best from the land. But if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. So God gives them a choice. Are you going to be willing and obedient, you know, to, to, to the law? You know, uh, you ever heard people, you know, try and uh, claim ignorance of the law? I didn't know it was, you know, it was 35 here. You know, you were doing 80. Well, I didn't know it was 35. Well, is, is ignorance a good uh, argument for a defense? No. You know, if you're willing... What does it say? And obedient. If they obeyed the law, did what it said, and if they did it willingly, you know, it, it shows the, the attitude of the heart. You know, are we willing to obey God and to do what he says? But he gives them a choice. He says, if you do those things, you will eat the best from the land. But if you resist and rebel, let me ask you, is that a different state of heart? A rebellious heart? Mm -hmm. Was the nation of Israel rebellious against God? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they didn't want to do it God's way. They wanted to do it their own way. Again, I'm sure glad we're not that way today. You know, rebelling against God and doing it our own way. Mm -hmm. I told you, you know, I've shared this before, but, you know, a survey was done, and this has been a few years ago, so it's probably changed a little bit. But one of the most popular songs sung at funerals and played at funerals a few years ago was, I did it my way. I think the same thing applies here. That's what the nation of Israel was trying to say. We, we want to do it our way, not your way, God. God had prescribed one way and one way only to come unto him, to draw near to him. And he says, what's, the, what's the, the outcome of this? You will be devoured by the sword. What happened to the nation of Israel after this? They were conquered, hauled off to captivity, oppressed. They were devoured by the sword. And you can't say, well, it was God's fault. No, God had given them a choice. He warned them. He says, if you do it my way, you'll eat the best of the land. 
If you do it your way, you'll be devoured mm -hmm. by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. But you know, the thing is, is we realize in the Bible that God never changes. This is his heart. Do we obey or do we resist? Well, I don't know about you, but one of the things I desire is to draw near to God. You know, to, because you'll find out in life, you're trying to find that which des, you know, satisfies the desires in our hearts. And you can try stuff. You ever tried to find satisfaction in stuff? You're happy for a moment, but then our stuff breaks, or it rusts, falls apart. It's not new and shiny anymore. It doesn't live up to the dream that was given about it. They come out with better stuff. They come out with better stuff, yeah. Newer and faster stuff. Yeah. Now yours is not the fastest, and you gotta get the other stuff, you know. But you know, you and I, the only thing that truly satisfies is, is, is God. Mm -hmm. When we draw near to him, all that other stuff fades away. Mm -hmm. he, you know, but God knows we like stuff, and he loves to give us good gifts. But the problem is with the nation of Israel is that stuff had become more important than God. Mm -hmm. Well, I can guarantee you, you can find mm -hmm. out what's most important in people's lives. Go to their checkbooks or their bank account, you know, the, the, the statement. Whatever they spend the most money on is what's most important to them. Let's continue looking at this idea a little bit of getting near to God. Turn with me now to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Now Paul is basically talking to the nation of Israel here because his heart was about the nation of Israel. He desired that they come to know Christ. But, you know, he is, you know, letting them know from first-hand experience that they are not going to find that satisfaction in the law. In fact, in other books he writes that the, the law was given to us to show us what sin truly is. Mm -hmm. That you can't live up to God's requirements if you're trying to earn your way to heaven. It's about that same faith that they were supposed to have in the Old Testament. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 1 says, The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year make perfect those who draw near to worship. See, in the Old Testament, you know, in the, in the, in the, the temple worship, the problem was is they knew that every year they were going to have to offer the, the same offering. You know, you would just get done offering a, a sin offering and off you go and all of a sudden somebody pulls out in front of you. You know, their, their cow gets in the way of your cow or something like that. And you get mad at them. Well, guess what? You're now guilty. You now have sin back on your account. It's no longer covered, it's exposed. So you know you got to go back and offer another offering. Again and again and again. You know, it's interesting in the, in the temple worship system, the, the priest, there was no chair for him to sit down in because his work was never done. Because this world is full of sinners, isn't it? Now, I are one, you know. I know, you know, that if it was up to me to maintain my salvation and my, my right standing with God, I'd blow it in about 30 seconds. And there I'd be again offering more sacrifices and trying to, you know, cover over my sins and, and earn my way into God's good graces. But he says that those can never make perfect those who draw near to worship. It never made them perfect. They were still of that sin nature. Okay? If it could, would they not have stopped bringing or being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. 
Under the sacrificial system, the sins were always there. They were just covered over by the blood of an innocent substitute who died in their place. It didn't take away their sins. It didn't make them perfect. It just took care of their, their bill for the moment. In the New Testament, we're told that the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Mm. Wages. Wages is something that you get paid and is due to you. Mm -hmm. A gift is something that's given to you. We earn death. God wants to give us life. <coughs> Okay, it's verse 5. This is, therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, O oh God. <laughs> that was found in Psalm 40. That was Jesus speaking there through the psalmist, saying, I am coming to do your will, God. Even though he is God, but he's God the Son. And he comes in obedience to fulfill the Father's desire. The Father's desire wasn't for all that blood to be shed. It was for them to have faith in his saving nature, in what he was going to do for the nation of Israel through his Son. But they didn't see it. They tried to earn their way into heaven. They thought their righteousness was going to get them there. And that's why I love studying about Paul, because he, he thought he was, he was something special. A Pharisee of the Pharisees, as, as we were talking about in Sunday school. He, he says, I was doing great until I read the part in the law that said, Thou shalt not covet. And he realized he was guilty of the law, and of breaking the law. And it says, and it slew me when he finally realized what the law was all about. The law is there to show you, you can't do it on your own. I, I've heard some people say, you know, I, I live up to the law's demands. No, you haven't. You think you have. Well, I've never murdered somebody, but Christ, you know, in, in, in the gospel says, if you even have had, you know, if you're angry at somebody, Inside your heart, you've already committed murder, and you're guilty of the law. Now, how, how are you doing with the law? You still think you're meeting the law's demands? You have to look at the heart of the law, too, not just the word. And we're all guilty of that, aren't we? Never have coveted after something. You know, never have, you know, broken the law in one shape or another, right? No. We're all guilty of death okay verse 8 first he said sacrifice and offerings burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire nor were you pleased with them although the law required them to be made then he said here I am I have come to do your will he sets aside the first to establish the second and by that will we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all times one sacrifice for sins, he sat down. Talking about Christ. You know, he is in the order of Melchizedek, and we won't get into that, but basically he's of a different order. The priests in the Old Testament, they were of the Aaronic priesthood. They were descendants of Aaron, the Levite, okay? Their, their, their ministry was never done. But when Christ offered his blood as the atoning sacrifice for our sins, it says he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, which signified his work was done. It was one offering, offered one time for all of humanity. 
Because he lived the perfect life that you and I can. He met the law's demands. Not just the word, but also the, the heart of the law, the intent of the law. He did it perfectly. So when he offered his blood as the sacrifice, God said, I accept that. And now for us, as we come to him, our sins are atoned for because an innocent substitute died on our behalf and offered his blood for our sins. Verse 13. Since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool because by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who, or being made holy? Here's a trick question. Anybody in here perfect? What did it just say there? He has made us perfect. In God's sight. Not in our own sight. I'm not saying I'm perfect here on earth that I never make a mistake. Oh boy, I make mistakes. And my wife will attest to that. Anybody else in here make mistakes? From the physical, from the flesh side, we are sinners still. And that flesh nature, right? But spiritually, because of what Christ done, God says, you are perfect. Your sins have been covered. Not only covered, but they're gone. That's the part that still blows my mind. Okay? I could understand in the Old Testament, you know, the sins being covered over. You know, if the dirt's there, you just paint over it, ta-da, it's gone. But here, the dirt's there, and then we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, and psh, dirt's gone. The stain is gone. It doesn't, it's not that it's been covered, it's been cleansed. God says, you're, you're no longer guilty. He continues on. Verse 15, the Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, this is the covenant I will make with them at that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and will write them on their minds. Remember the argument that, that God had against the nation of Israel? They didn't know his laws and they didn't know his word. Well, as we come to him, God says, I will put his, his law on our hearts and put his word in our thoughts, in our minds. We can't get away from him. And it's why is because he desires this close relationship again. Not like the one that the, the Israelites had, because they, they didn't care. They thought, oh, it's okay, I'll go offer my, my sacrifices and then I'll go do whatever I want. I'm good to go for another year. There's religions out there that promote that. You know, well, oh, that was a really bad sin. Well, you got to pay a little bit extra this year for your, for your atonement. Go say this and go do that and you'll be fine. That, that's works. You can't work your way out of sin. But here God says, I'm going to put my, my word inside of you. Who is the word? But Christ himself. He lives inside of us according to his word. Read John chapter 14. And then he says in verse 17, then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. See, in Christ, God says, your sins I don't remember anymore. It's not that we didn't commit them. And it's not like God forgot. He says, because of Jesus and what he did, I choose to remember your sins no more because they've been atoned for. The thing that the Israelites didn't perceive through the sacrificial system, that the atonement was made by that, that shedding of blood, God says, I remember it. I seen it. That Jesus presented it to me on your behalf. And because you've accepted him and the gift that he gives to you, I choose to remember your sins no more. So my question is, is what sin? Yesterday's? He doesn't remember. How about today's? 
Anybody sin today? It's not a confessional. Don't, don't answer that. How about tomorrow's? He says, I choose to remember their sins no more. That's not a, a license to sin. That's just the reality of God knowing who we are. And I will tell you right now, as you commit sins, you know, today, tomorrow, whatever the case may be, yet yeah, your sins, you know, God has provided that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Until you do that, your, your, your sins right now interfere with your relationship with God. It's an insulation between you and God. That, that, that fellowship that you could be having with God is interrupted. But it goes on to say in verse 18, And where these have been forgiven, there is no longer any sacrifice for sin. I think it's sad right now that the nation of Israel is trying to bring back the temple system. They want to build the third temple. You probably heard that in the news. That's their desire. They've got all the, the stones already cut, all the instruments prepared. In fact, they've got the, 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 the we're pretty sure they have them, the, the, the ashes of the red heifer. That's required to be a part of the cleansing ceremony you read in the Old Testament. They have everything. They're just waiting on the ability to build it there on the temple now. When will that happen? But they still think that they're going to go back to the shedding of blood of bulls and goats and all that for the atonement of the sins of the nation of Israel. Here God says, and where these have been forgiven, there is no longer any sacrifice for sin. See, God won't accept that way anymore because that's the old covenant. He's saying there's a new covenant now and it's in the blood of my son Jesus. He says there, and he continues on now, he says, therefore. And anytime you see that word therefore in the Bible, really, you need to understand why it's there, what it's there for, okay? Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God, with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith. He says, because of all this, because your sins have been forgiven, the atonement has been made, draw near to God. Well, I, I got to get myself right. If you have Christ Jesus, you're right in God's eyes. You can come to him and say, God, I made, I made a mess of things. Any of you ever had to go and say, God, I've made, I've made a mess of things mm -hmm. other than me? Oh, yes. oh yeah. And, and God goes, oh, tell me about it. And, and we sit there and tell him about the things we've done. He says, yeah, they're already forgiven in my son. And we start to realize that our sins have been atoned for. But he likes for us to tell him things. Tell him when our heart isn't right, when our desires aren't right, when, when we make a mess of things. He says, oh, tell me more. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I want to remind you that Jesus, my son, died for those sins too. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith. In the Old Testament, were they drawing near to God in faith? Mm -hmm. Well, they started that way. When they set up the temple and, the, and then there was that fear and reverence of God and, and, and it terrified the high priest to go into the presence of God because you know, they knew that their sins needed to be covered by the blood of the bull. And all, you know, we looked at that on the day of atonement that was given to mankind. But there in Isaiah, they weren't drawn near in faith. They were just going through the motions. It says, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. See, the law could never cleanse the conscience. But what Christ has accomplished through us, this grace given to us, it cleanses us inside and out. 
The, the temple worship, it, it was an external thing. They, they were clean on the outside, basically, through what they did. God says, no, I want you to be clean on the inside, too. You know, Jesus got after the Pharisees. He says, basically, you're, you're just a, a bunch of whitewashed tomb full of dead men's bones. Mm -hmm. Problem was, the outside looked really religious. You know, and that's how we judge people, by how they look. Oh, they're really religious. Look at them. They look the part, right? Does God care about the outside? No. I think of that cross. And there was next to Jesus' cross a thief who was stripped naked, beaten and bloodied also. And all he could do is after... He at first ridiculed Christ too with the other thief. But then he had a change of heart and he looked at Jesus and said, Remember me when you enter into your kingdom. Mm -hmm. And Christ said, Today you'll be with me in paradise. Mm -hmm. Having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. We're going to stop there today. But he who promised is faithful. See, God made these promises. Not just a, a religious system. Not just a pastor. Not just somebody that's trying to lead, you know, hey, just follow me. God is the one that has made these promises to us. That if we put our faith and our trust in his son, Jesus, that our sins will be not only covered, but they'll be cleansed. You'll be dirty no more. That that stain will be gone. He's better than any detergent. He gets the stain out. And that stain is sin. But he cleanses us. And that's his promise to us. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this day and for the time that we spend in your word. And Lord, thank you for your promises to us. The promise that you will cleanse us, that you will forgive us of our sins, Lord, and that, Lord, that we can draw near to you. For, Lord, that's our desire, is to draw near to you. For you're the, the one thing that gives us purpose in life and meaning. All the rest of the things of this world, Lord, fade. But you never fade. You never change, Lord. Your desire is that we can have this fellowship and, and to, to walk with you, Lord, day by day. You who are our maker. Lord, thank you for providing a way back to you through your son, Jesus. We ask, Lord, that you'll help us to be able to share this good news. That this world around us, too, can find their way back to you if they would just put their faith and their trust in your Son, our High Priest Jesus. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.